My guest today is Layla Porter. Layla, how are you? I'm good, thank you, David. How are you? I'm doing really well. How's everything in the UK? Uh, it's pretty good. We've got nice sunny days. Spring has definitely sprung, so it does help to keep the mood nice and lifted. <laughs> Uh, that makes a big difference. I'm actually looking out my window right now. It's, it looks like there's a little fog, but yeah, I'm optimistic for a good day. It's morning here. It is. Well, it's after lunch here, and I've got the curtains closed on the beautiful day, just so like I'm not a washed out blur to you on the video. So I'm in the video studio now. So all the lights. You have a video are, studio. Um, <laughs> sort of, because I do some streaming. So it, it's really um, my partner's office because my office is very lived in um, <laughs> and his office is very um, minimalist uh -huh. and he has all these cool colored lights so it's kind of nice to do videos in here. It so. does look like the, the, the yeah. lighting reflects well on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, tell me about your streaming. What kind of, what do you do when you stream? Um, well, most recently I've had some guests on, um, similar to this, um, we go for about two and a half hours and I have guests come on and show me some code and sort of get some nice interactions with the chat. So it's very casual, good bit of fun. Oh, excellent. What's the, how can people reach you there? Um... Or you can send me the URL if you don't have it memorized. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's um, it's just on Twitch. I do it tw twitch.tv slash Layla Codes It. And uh, okay. yeah, I've, um, I don't know how much streaming I'll be doing in the future because I've got a lot of projects on at work at the moment. Oh, and I see. Uh, yeah, so I've been doing since uh, we've been home, staying at home more, and I've not been traveling as much. I've been doing some streaming with that. And uh, I've had some awesome guests on actually, and we've talked about everything from HTTP and proper rest, uh, to how to make the most of your time at home and be really productive and balance your, your work and, and life, uh, to GraphQL and security. So we've had some really varied um, topics on it. So it's been good fun. Have you ever had any Americans on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Most maybe, of my guests have been American, actually. Maybe, uh, maybe you could invite me on your show sometime. Ah, okay. I, I consider yourself invited. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Yay, you'll have to get up early, a good day though. can turn into a great day. <laughs> ah, no, it'd be my pleasure to have you on. <laughs> I know you and I were on, on uh, Jeff Fritz's show the same day, but I missed you. I, I had a drop oh, before I you know. enjoyed. Well, Everyone messaged me and said, come on, Layla, um, Fritz is going to do his challenge that I set him and I I went on and you'd already left and Fritz had already yeah. done his challenge because I'd been in meetings and I was like mm. uh, and uh, yeah I was sad to have missed you then uh, but we're, here we are today but we the story are. has a happy ending absolutely I want to talk to you about test driven development because I know you talk about that a lot and you, you're, yes. you're, you're passionate about it I am I I found it a few years ago um when I was a senior developer and uh, at a company where we didn't even have a unit test, let alone any TDD or processes. And uh, we had this whole system that, you know, it was telecommunications and we had thousands of minutes going through or millions of minutes going through this system. And there really was not a single unit test. Mm -hmm. And, um, we had a team of six testers and that was what we relied on. And I remember I came across TDD because it was nine weeks of regression bug fixes uh, and it nearly destroyed me, like my soul, you know, just going through and fixing all these regression bugs because we didn't have any tests. So we didn't safely refactor or we didn't meet the requirements correctly and yeah, I thought there has to be a better way. So I started to look into TDD and yeah, that must have been in 2016. Um, so I've been quite the advocate for it since then. Can you define for folks that don't know, what is TD, TDD? Test-driven development. It, it's the process of looking at your requirements. Uh, so from your, your task list or your project manager or your project owner or yourself and saying, what exactly do I want my code to do? And that's a big picture. And then you can break that down into easy units of work. So maybe I need to um, this code to return 
a 200 response or something, something simple. If this happens, it's going to return a 200. Uh, and then you go and write a test that says, if this, uh, this event happens, we're going to return a 200. And then that's when you can write your code. So you and write the code before you write the test? No, not at all. You write your test before you write your code. Oh my goodness, that's different from what I do. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> that, that actually sounds counterintuitive to me, uh, at least from from the way I came up as a developer. Why do you write the code, or why do you write, why do you write the test first? So if you write your code first, which isn't wrong, I'm not going to say that. This is just one way of doing it, yeah. and it happens to suit me, and it doesn't suit everybody. But if you write your code first, and then you go and write your tests, you may write your tests to fit around your code rather than your requirements. So your code may return, I don't know, a 204. And you'll be like, OK, I'm going to write a test that says this should return a 204. But in your requirements, it says, well, actually, this should return a 200. But you, you've written your code, and you've sort of forgotten about your requirements now, as it quite often uh. happens. And then you've written your test, and it passes, because you've looked at your code and says, well, this needs to, my code returns a 204, so I'm going to write a test that says if this is passed, if it returns a 204. So that's one example of where writing code before your tests could cause you some issues. I mean, there's lots of other reasons, um, but it is, it's one of the sort of most simple ones. Um, another really good one, it's one of my favorites actually, is if you're on a, a team, if you've got, um, you, like if you're doing test-driven development, I think it's much easier to write code asynchronously. And by that, I mean, you have people working on different parts of the code without being dependent on someone else's code being written first. Uh, people are dependent. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand how that relates to test driven development. Well, if you've got someone who's writing some, some code over here, yes. and you come along and write some code, if they've already written if they've got the tests and you've got tests, you're far less likely to a break their code unwittingly. Mm -hmm. So you've got your tests first okay. and you're going in and building stuff. And um, you've got obviously to, to do a lot of test driven development. If you're doing it on a big scale, okay. you've probably got things like interfaces in already and that's a coding contract. Okay. So you can write those and write all your tests against it before you've even written your code. And then, other people can come along and use your interface, for example, and they can go and write their code. But because all the tests are in place, so just because it's their code and they haven't written the test, the tests are still there. So it's still test driven, but they're less likely to break your code because all those tests are there ready in place and they can go and write their code and you don't have to have written your code yet. Oh. But they can use okay. so your I, code. I think if I'm understanding correctly, you're talking about uh, designing the contract in which other other components can interact with your code before you've actually written the code itself. So that way people have something to write to, something that they understand. Yes. And they, even if you've forgotten yeah. all the requirements, the tests have, the tests are coded. They're part of the computer. They're part of their chip. Absolutely. And, source code. and if you break those requirements, then, then the test will fail. Yeah. So it's kind of a higher level um, look at TDD that I like to do. So it's not just your little unit of code. It's how does this impact the entire system? Okay. And all your colleagues. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I've always thought that one of the other advantages of, of test driven or not, I should even say test driven uh, of having a good set of automated tests is when I start to refactor my code, when I make oh, big yeah. changes to it then uh, there's a there's a high risk involved in that. Oh, yes. You might break Massive risk. In, internally, even though there's yes. no, even I'm the only developer that's working on it. Um, and, but the thing is, one. you might break it and not know, David. Right. Talk a little bit and about that. And that's the scary thing. Um, well, this goes back to what brought me to TDD and those regression bugs. If you've got a whole suite of tests, um, and I mean, you don't have to run those all the time. Once they're passed and you've stopped coding, you can turn those, those off 
for a while. But if you come back to it, yeah, because you don't want to say you might have 500,000 tests on a big project and you don't want to have to run those every time you go in and write a code that's in a totally unrelated section. Uh, okay. So once you've stopped development, you can turn those tests off in the task in the test runner. So you can freeze those. Um, I'd still say have them running on your build server, for example, because you might have um, broken something and that will come up on the build server. But if you're working in a totally unrelated section of the code, it, it doesn't make sense to have all of those tests switched on all the time. So you can, you can sort of make them quiet, but they're still there. So some people do that. I don't tend to do that because the biggest test a number of tests I've had has been about a hundred thousand in a project wow. that I've worked on. That's a um, lot. And yeah, it doesn't take that long to run either because sometimes it just looks to see if there's been changes in mm -hmm. your IDE when you run it. We'll only run the ones that maybe there's been a change to the code and things. There's different ways that you can set it up. And um, so if you've got those tests and you come back in six months time, you may have forgotten like what's your code supposed to do and you're like, oh, I've got to plumb in this new feature and you start fiddling around. And what you might do is change a little bit of functionality here, reuse a method. And if you then run your tests and they fail, you know that you've had a regression and you've broken something. So you can go through and rectify that. So that means that you can go and safely refactor everything you want um, without that fear that you'll have an unknown, and that's the scary thing, the unknown breakages or the, the things in parts that you don't know about. Um, so that's also a risk if you do turn off sections of your testing. Mm -hmm. When you do a refactor, you might do it. So that's why I said you wouldn't want to do that on your, your build server, or, for example. You'd want to have that only on your local development if you were running tests a lot. Um, and you want to speed up your your development, your okay. test running time. Okay, so every time you make a change, or maybe every time you check in a change, you'd want to uh, run all the relevant tests, but before you actually push to a new environment, like push to testing or push to uh, the d yeah. production, then then you want to run every single test, turn them all on and make sure that they're... Yeah, I would say thing. have them all on for, if you're, if you're moving from like UAT to production for sure. I'd want to run them all. I mean, some people don't, uh, I mean, it depends how your, your DevOps is set up. And I'm not, not big into DevOps um, because maybe you have staging and you're just flipping some um, a staging over to production and things like that. So you might not actually do a build at that stage. So it, it's however you set up your, your pipeline and your, your CI CD pipelines as well. So you can, you can factor it into it anyway. And you can also have test coverage, um, which can be really irritating, but can enforce good practice of unit testing. What is test coverage? So you can set a percentage of uh, test coverage to your project and what that means is you can say well like a high one would be 80% of this code must be covered by tests and every time you go to push to your to your uh, repository if you've got test coverage set up if you don't meet 80% or more or say you have it it must always increase stay the same or increase if it drops your test coverage percentage then your your push gets rejected because you haven't written enough tests to cover your code. Wow. So um, I've done that and it can be very irritating. Say you bring in a, a NuGet package as well. I remember I brought in AutoMapper once uh -huh. and then I dropped my test coverage by 15% or something like that. Oh, because and the like, AutoMapper <gasps> code was being part, yes. of the, as, as part of the denominator in that. Yeah, so you have to go in and say, ignore this section so it, yeah, it can be so. fiddly I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a guess that maybe jimmy and his team have actually written tests to cover automapper itself i would say that that's jimmy's problem not mine <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna tell him you said that uh, oh yeah i i'm happy to tell him myself <laughs> and that i trust that he's properly tested his um right. his stuff so <laughs> i'm not going to test it for him <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, personally, I'm a fan of looking at test coverage, but not of mandating test coverage because that's the, yeah. part of it because of what the example you just said. 
yeah it's um it's my biggest thing about tdd is just to be pragmatic because i've had dogmatic lead developers and they've come up and seen that i've just got involved in the code and i've written a whole load of code and i haven't really done TDD. It happens to all of us. You just say, oh, and I'll just do this. And oh, if I just, oh, that needs to do that. And you get into your flow, don't you? And you just want to write some code. That's okay. Um, but I've had um, my lead developer um, at one company came up and was like, Layla, you've not been doing TDD. And I was like, oh yeah, I know. I, I've written like six tests and then I got carried away. <laughs> and he's like, if I see that happen again, I'm going to delete your whole entire day's work. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of stories. It's extreme, and it's really demoralizing because you yeah. think, oh, I'm I'm in the, the zone. I just got carried away, and I was enjoying writing the code, and, oh, I, I would have gone and written the tests and afterwards. Then comes this buzzkill in. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Are you doing it wrong? <laughs> delete, delete, delete. And, um, yeah, it's a git force reset. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> it would just kill you, and... Uh, I think it's a real cultural shift to go to 100% TDD. Um, and I was fairly new to TDD. I'd come from the environment where we didn't even write unit tests. Right. Um, and so I'd get into the zone of writing my code and I'd be like, oh, oh I haven't written the tests. Oh, let me go. I, I'll start finish writing all these tests for the code I've written and then I'll, I'll restart again doing it TDD. Um, and that's that's a perfectly natural way to gradually shift your way into, into TDD. It, it is a big change. It's difficult to think about how you want your code to come out. It does make you more thoughtful, I will say that, and more focused. You don't get that shaving the yak mentality <laughs> of, I'll just do this, and oh, I need to do this before I can do that, you know, so. <laughs> it keeps you focused. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Yeah, although I think I, I'm a, uh, very much agreeing with you that there's, there's very little dogma in computer science, that uh, you have to be practical, and there's a lot of good yes. guidance, but uh, if you deviate from that, that's not the end of the world. You need to th think about it. No that particular situation so i wish i'd been in the room with that guy i'm assuming it was a guy it sounds like a guy to me <laughs> it was a guy and uh he's he's very clever but incredibly dogmatic yeah. and i've had a lot of people come up to me and say that my approach to tdd isn't purist that's, but that's another okay. word so that so i i agree but that's okay <laughs> it's like if they want to go and do it very pure um, and, you know, completely f scratch the bare minimum, that's okay too. I, I have my happy medium that works very well for me and the people that I code with. Um, but if they want to go and be purist, that, that's their, their option. It's, I'm not going to go and tell them they shouldn't do it in the purest fashion. What language do you typically write in? Uh, generally C sharp. So. Do you have a set of tools, uh, testing tools that you prefer? Well, I develop a lot on a Mac. So I use Rider and that testing tools, if you're meaning in the IDE. Um, so I use all of their test runner. Um, I quite like that. And if I'm in Visual Studio, I'd use ReSharper um, and all of that testing tools. Um, as a testing sort of library, I generally air to N unit in C sharp. Um, I mean, I've had this discussion with people. Some people really like X unit, some people like the Microsoft own testing uh, library, but I, I just get on very well with N unit. Um, it's, it's not as um, consistently maintained as say X unit. Um, but for the type of development I do, uh, NUnit works a treat. And I love things like the test cases. So you can have a single test and you can pass loads of stuff in. And you can do that on the other ones, but I just know how to use NUnit well. And, and I stick with that. So I, they're all yeah. much of a much, to be honest. Yeah, I think NUnit is the oldest one on, on the .NET platform. It was certainly the first one I heard of. 
It was the first one I used and then sort of XUnit became more prevalent and the Microsoft one, I think, came later and didn't have as many features as the others had. I think, but now they're all on par really, so. Yeah. Um, I know you speak about this at conferences and user groups and I heard you talk about uh, Terminator. <laughs> What's the relevance of Terminator to test your <laughs> Yeah, so um, my favorite talk is TDD and the Terminator. TDD and the Terminator. I don't know. I'm too shy to do that. <laughs> I should, though. I should. <laughs> I will come to your next talk. Oh, Trust definitely. as the Terminator. <laughs> you do. do. You that. need to stand in the corner and we'll get you some like prosthetics. The on Arnold and Terminator, not the liquid Terminator. <laughs> Yes, yes, the T-800 series. So um, when I started to learn TDD, I found it really challenging. I mean, really, really challenging. I'd watch YouTube videos of people who were saying, here's how you do TDD, and it looked like magic, literally like magic. And I, I was like, I don't understand this. And I was reading through blogs and tutorials, and I was just, it wasn't clicking. And uh, I thought, okay, I need a real life example to help me learn this. So I'm gonna code it, so I need something. And I thought, I'm a massive fan of Terminator. What's your favorite Terminator movie, David? The first one. The first one? The first one? Yes. Okay. I'm a T2 person. Okay. Yeah, I do love T2. So um, I munge T1 and T2 together in my talk for purposes of, you know, my talk and my wishes. So um, we start basically with how to program a, a T800 and we look at the requirements. So this is gonna be hunting down, looking at boys, girls, women and men to see if any of them are Sarah Connor. And if so, we wanna go and investigate further. So that's kind of how I start coding up this Terminator and I'm like, all right, so what does our Terminator need to do? If it's he's a woman, it, it should go and investigate further. And, and that's when it started to click. Ah, oh, so that should be my first test. Hmm. Um, and it was breaking the requirements down into these little statements, which actually become your, your test method names. Hmm. Um, so that's what I, my first one would, um, you know, Terminator should determine to investigate a woman further. Um, and if it oh, sees... So these are the, the things that appear across the, uh, the, 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 the eyeball of the Terminator. Yes. He's looking Shall I investigate? <laughs> Shall yeah. I investigate? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, if it's, he's a woman, it's going to... Well, I'm looking for a woman, so I should investigate this one further in case it's Sarah Connor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, that's our first test that we write and then we write just enough code to get that to pass and this was the big aha moment for me so that that test needs to return true like if I see a woman I should investigate true so the big moment for me was when I went to write my code and thought what's the bare minimum amount of code I can write to get that test to pass hmm. and it literally was return true yes and that was like, <laughs> my head blown. I was like, I get it. Yep. I understand. Um, so then I started to like add in a few more and then you refactor your code. So I use the um, red green uh, refactor process. So oh, you write that? a failing test first, yeah. that's your red because failing tests are red on an IDE generally. And then you write just enough code to get it to pass, which makes you green and then you refactor so you do the next stage so mm -hmm. um i if i'm doing very good tdd that's where i do sometimes i get sloppy and lazy and that's okay because i'm still writing code and i've got good intentions and and that's okay with me so uh, i'll do that and then um part of where i munge everything together in my talk is that we have a massive requirement change because now in t2 our t800 is protecting john and sarah connor right. so we have to go through and refactor our code and i i sort of talk through how we can do that with good um 
use of solid principles and, and just refactoring robust code. So it's, we don't have to touch so much code in the future and we've got less technical debt. So I sort of guide people through that and uh, I have a lot of fun at it because I've got video clips from the Terminator movies and stuff like that. So That sounds really cool. I want to see this talk in person when we all get to go out and actually <laughs> Yes. Uh, all right, we're just about out of time. Is there anything we haven't covered that you think we should? Um, I think the main thing is if you are trying TDD, be kind to yourself. It, it's a massive cultural change. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, small steps, small successes, um, and just do your best. Um, and ha be patient with yourself and others who are trying to learn it. So, yeah. Excellent. Uh, do you, Where's a good place for people to go that they want to get started learning this? Um, well, you'll watch my talk. Um, is that online a, somewhere? It, it is. There's a, it's a couple of places. Um, it's on YouTube, um, on the JetBrains channel, actually. Okay. If you can send um, me a link to that, I'll put it in the show notes. I can send you a link for that. And also, uh, Microsoft have done it as part of their MVPs sessions or something. So Microsoft have a shortened version of it. Um, so I, I should have a link for that tomorrow. Uh, so it will be on there. And it's around, um, there's a few recordings of it from conferences and things like that. Um, and I think the best way to learn it is just to set yourself a, your own little dummy project with something that you can relate to mm -hmm. and just have a play. Excellent. And I, I think you earned your MVP in the last year. Is that correct? I did. I was awarded... And so you year. didn't get to attend the summit, which is no. which is sad because oh, I used to be an MVP, and that's the best part of being an MVP is going to the summit. I was gutted, and I'm not going to get to go to it next year either. Why not? You know already. Everything is virtual at Microsoft. All events have been announced to be virtual until July 2021. Oh, I didn't hear that announcement. Wow. Yeah, it came out yesterday. Ah, uh, well, that's that's really bad. Well, yeah. we'll have to, hopefully I'll see you in uh, I never see you in the UK or in the US or <laughs> in Chicago but uh, yes. see you somewhere <laughs> in the world between now it and is, now. it's always like in well we first met in Oslo didn't we so. I think that's right, yes I was trying to remember where we first met but, uh, we were trying to run for the boat cruise <laughs> that's right Oh yeah. <laughs> we made it too <laughs> we did, we did, we made it and it was Some awesome <laughs> Layla, thank you so much for your time this has been really interesting Oh, it's my pleasure, David. Thank you. When I changed career to one in technology, it really opened up an entire world to me with travel to conferences and basically lots of events everywhere. And it also allowed me to make so many amazing new friends.